I had actually read this book that Adeline Levine, one of the first sociologists to write about the environment, wrote about Love Canal, with the, the title Love Canal. And she was a faculty member at Buffalo. Love Canal exploded around her. And she said, I've got to take my students out there and have this, the, the case study for our course this year. It wasn't the course of the, the environment. There were no environmental sociology courses at that time. But she was very committed to this and um, did a great job of getting her students to interview everybody and to look at the process as it went through the local health authorities, the New York State Department of Health, and looking at all the organizing. And you know, it was a very big deal. She wrote this book. and. I read it and I said, you know, I have a name for this. If it were me, I would call this popular epidemiology. And this was a, a period of time where we were using the term popular a lot. You know, so popular this, popular that. It meant that people were involved. It was like grassroots lay kind of approach to life. And it's like it just stayed in my brain for a long time until we began to interview the people in Woburn. And of course, what they were doing there was they were working with scientists at the Harvard School of Public Health to conduct this very large-scale epidemiological study. And it meant that they were going out interviewing people about their exposures and their uh, proximity to the water system and other things of that sort. So they, they were engaging in science and they were doing what other people have called uh, creekside epidemiology, barefoot epidemiology. I got to bring in my term popular epidemiology. It just fit perfectly because they had uh, an enormous amount of scientific impact in that study. So the public paradigm, I take this idea from Shelley Krimsky, who is a wonderful environmental scholar at Tufts at the Department of Urban and Environmental Policy. And he wrote a book uh, called Hormonal Chaos. And this was a social science and a science and technology studies approach to looking at how the endocrine disruptor hypothesis had grown and become accepted. And it really starts with Theo Colborn and Pete Myers and Diane Dumanowski in their book, uh, Our Stolen Future which is a wonderful book, uh, and they have a website in which they continue to update this work. They were fighting against uh, the dominant paradigm, which didn't understand that endocrine disruptors were important, and that many of the chemicals that we're concerned about were acting as endocrine disruptors in people's bodies and animals' bodies as well. So uh, Theo Colborn, sort of like Rachel Carson, tied together a lot of evidence from disparate studies and showed uh, a real trend in science that endocrine disruptors were very prevalent in our environment and that they were having a lot of harmful effects. Shelley Krimsky then looked at how this uh, played out, how it spread. So instead of synthesizing the science, he was looking at how the science spread out to the public, to uh, the legislatures, to everybody else concerned with it. And he had this idea of a public hypothesis, so that a scientific hypothesis now was being discussed in public, that the average lay person, uh, that the average educated professional, whether it was a lawyer or a legislator, could take part in this. It wasn't only at the laboratory bench. And so I like the idea then of that. And uh, having worked with Shelley a lot, I borrowed this uh, with much credit to him uh, and called it the public paradigm where people were helping to form new paradigms by working together in these collectivities, sometimes formal collectivities, collaborations between researchers and citizens groups, and sometimes more informal, uh, almost what we call invisible colleges, you know, groups of, of people with like-minded ideas working together to put forth a new innovative direction. So this notion of the dominant epidemiological paradigm is not that there's a, always a monolithic paradigm, a singular view that says disease is caused by these factors, but there generally tend to be uh, well-accepted ideas, beliefs, and opinions. So for instance, and, and that can sometimes be a good one. Now we understand a very clear relationship between tobacco 
and lung cancer. We understand a very clear relationship between lead and various kinds of uh, developmental disabilities, uh, lowered IQ, neurological and other systems damages. Uh, we didn't know that previously and so we had a sense that, for instance, uh, many of the things that looked strange to us in Gulf War illness were psychiatric as opposed to related to chemicals. Uh, or even with asthma, it's a very good example, uh, when I began this there was only the beginnings of an understanding that air pollution was uh, a very important cause of exacerbation of asthma attacks and later on it would become even uh, a cause, not just an exacerbation of ex existing asthma. Uh, with breast cancer people felt you know, that it was diet, that if you thought about environmental things, that radiation, yes, but uh, you know, that not in terms of toxic chemicals. So it wasn't just that scientists felt that way, but the policymakers also. So they weren't regulating chemicals looking for that. The funding agencies were not funding research to make those connections. The foundations weren't doing educational work around that. The health organizations like the American Cancer Society weren't doing education and advocacy around environmental causes. So everybody basically was seeing breast cancer as genetic, as you know, a very limited number of uh, other causes such as radiation. But they were very antagonistic to the notion that there were environmental factors involved. And so all the popular magazines then follow that, the scientific journals follow that, uh, the medical school curriculum follows that. And if you look at this dominant epidemiologic paradigm, it shows you that throughout science, throughout public uh, media, throughout uh, the educational apparatus, the funding apparatus, all these different elements that make up a belief system and a knowledge system were antagonistic to an environmental cause. Well, this is something that uh, medical sociologists have looked at all along, and it you know, tends to be similar to a dominant epidemiological paradigm. It's the idea that you have typically a, a single cause for a single disease, and that you only look at those kinds of approaches, whether they be very macro, in other words, uh, sewage spills, and then there's a likelihood of infectious diseases, or at molecular level, um, that uh, a certain chemical can cause a certain DNA break. Um, but it doesn't necessarily look at all of the other environmental factors that could be part of that. It doesn't look at what medicine now has understood very much to be the importance of social stress and social supports in mediating illness. Uh, and you know, recovery from various illnesses is also profoundly affected by the social networks that you're in, the kinds of stigma that you face or don't face. And so the critics of the biomedical model wanted to say, yes, of course there are, are clear uh, issues in infectious and chronic disease that can be seen biologically and biochemically, but there are so many other things that make up this complex. And at first, you know, these were very uh, obscure ideas back when, uh, in the 60s, when people like Rene Dubow were writing about this. And, uh, some of the first work on stress was coming out, and, and now we understand the importance of that. So uh, people's levels of stress and social support, the environment they're in, um, the epigenetic effects of a chemical that in tandem with a DNA break uh, or damage can lead to a profoundly larger impact than just that DNA damage alone. Uh, we're beginning to see a much wider range of causes. So the critique of the biomedical model was to, to say, let's, let's look broader. Well, we talked about popular epidemiology, you know, yeah. the idea that lay people look at things around them and see that something is going on, either a disease cluster. Uh, in rural areas, people who fish a lot will notice either the absence of fish that they always knew or they'll see a fish kill. Uh, people will smell the release of hydrogen sulfide when 
uh, petroleum waste are being dumped in a, a, a deep injection well. Um, there are all these things that they see, smell, and notice because they are aware of their natural environment. And then they call this uh, to the attention of other co-residents, uh, to sympathetic professionals, to health officials, to legislators, and seek knowledge, study, redress, regulation. Critical epidemiology is a concept more the way that epidemiologists as scientists think about this. Uh, how can they look at epidemiology in a more complex way than just how to one or several factors cause a disease? So they begin to look at what would be the sources of the chemicals that they're concerned with, what would be the barriers to understanding why would uh, government agencies be reluctant to find evidence for this? Uh, why would corporations uh, be trying to counter this with their own, what we now call tobacco science? Well, I'm gathering you probably got that from Living Downstream, uh, which was one of the, the greatest books you know, ever written about this and recently revised and uh, a beautiful movie was made of it, which I don't know if you've seen, uh, but it had its premiere uh, in Boston uh, several months back and uh, Sandra was there, Sandra Steingraber was there to talk about it along with the filmmaker. And it doesn't cover everything in the book, but it covers a large chunk of it. And she actually does travel back to the parts of Illinois uh, and where she writes about and to, to speak with her family and to give that really personal first-hand knowledge of it. But in Living Downstream, she argues, you know, we have this old public health paradigm that you've got to go upstream to get the causes rather than wait downstream to treat the problem, whether it's an illness or an endangered species or anything else. And so the idea of living downstream is that we all live downstream from some contamination going on upstream. It was a classic story, you know, it's, you know, the cardinal approach to public health and one of the ways public health always defines itself as different from medicine, that we want to prevent disease, not just come in and treat it.